Haunted houses! Cheesier than pizza, cheaper than it too. But who doesn't like a cheap pizza every now and again? Actually, that's not a fair comparison. Haunted houses are more like horror theater. I mean, who goes to a play and sits there saying, hmm, I don't believe this is really happening. Where am I going with this? Oh yeah, Outlast. Otherwise known as Haunted House, the video game, where you do little more than roam, run, and hide. Thankfully, you brought the most important tool for the job. No, not a gun. A video camera, dummy. With its trusty, handy dandy night vision. Stay back. I'll green you to death. Now, detractors of this game will talk about how over the top, edgy, s simplistic, and jump scare heavy the game is. All those things are true. We will not make excuses for Outlast's shortcomings, but instead, we will love it despite its flaws. Our tale starts with a man named Miles and his journalistic integrity. Something something insert generic joke about gaming journalism. Oh fuck, I was supposed to replace that part of the script with some other joke, wasn't I? The rest is pretty basic stuff. You find unimaginable horrors, it links to the evils of capitalism, an evil trope that goes back as long as I can remember. Also, Joe the Human Thumb Rogan chases you through the mansion so he can tell you about his experiences on DMT. Hence, you must escape. Sound design here is phenomenal, and I typically don't talk about a game's sound design because I don't have the ear for it. But it truly does a lot of heavy lifting for this game. You hear every camera zoom and background scream, also every sound your character makes, from him losing his breath when he has to run more than like two minutes, to him whimpering to himself out of fear. It's just, it's all incredibly atmospheric. The type of atmospheric where you can just shut your eyes and feel the post-traumatic stress disorder wash over you. Uh, let's get back to the concept of the haunted house for a second, because I have a greater point to that. See, I went back to a haunted house with my family back in 2022, and it was a blast. Was it the scariest thing ever? Not even close, but neither are some of my favorite horror games. What worked was how they used high and low moments, distractions, and unnerving interactions with spooky characters to catch me off guard and buy into the little world that they crafted. They'd ask me to enter smoke-filled rooms and walk through blown-up airbags and even jagged, uneven floors, all with the expectation of something popping out at me at some point. Scares would play off of each other, and there was more of the sense that you were being interacted with instead of just passively experiencing something. And on that note, I remember going to bad haunted houses as a kid where all they had was just some spooky imagery behind like a rope or something and a few lame jump scares. All this to say that the difference between a good and bad haunted house is a good haunted house uses a mix of environmental interactivity and crafted scares to sell an illusion. Shut the f up, phone! A bad one has you interact with almost nothing and occasionally just says, BOO! Be scared! Outlast's strike is how it plays on inherent fears to set up and deliver these scary moments. Like, a good early moment in this game is with this guy in a wheelchair. You see him, and you immediately think, Oh yeah, they're definitely gonna pop out at me. But nothing happens. Then you enter a room full of these guys, and you're like, Oh, okay, one of these guys is going to attack me. But no, they're all too busy watching a concert from their favorite band, Static X. You get a key card, you run back, the guys watching the Static X concert still don't bother you, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> The game set up a threat, told me to conquer it, and used my expectations against me, and I think that's brilliant. That premise also works in the opposite direction. Like, there will be moments where you're being chased by something and you're just narrowly getting away when something pops out at you. It's great because it focuses you on one threat to catch you off guard with another. This game also has a reoccurring threat in the form of Chris Walker, a hawking beast of a man who doesn't know how to wipe his mouth after eating jam. Now, imagine getting trapped in a prison ward with him, with your only way out being a staircase at the end of the hallway that you have to loop around once you get to the second floor just to get out of the damn place. What if your only hiding spots were under these beds inside cells where you have barely any visibility of the main area and hence of the threat itself? Because honestly, it's one of my favorite moments of this game. 
You're put in a position where you're forced between trying to be cautious and burning your battery power and having to eventually just go for it because if you run out of battery power, you're f Speaking of which, another one of my favorite moments with this guy is one where you're trapped in a dark sewer with him trying to find the way out, fumbling along the way in waist high water. What works is the water itself because it makes you feel like every movement can alert this guy to your presence so you're just desperately trying to find the exit as fast as possible hoping that doesn't happen. Then you have the pseudo villain. Each at last has one and I say pseudo villain because they're never really established. Like yeah okay there's probably notes that I can find that do give greater context and build up to these, these enemies but pff, I don't care about the lore. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're just running through the game like I do, these characters show up, torch you a bit, you play a game of cat and mouse with them before they meet an unfortunate fate. Here is a mad doctor named Trigger who first pretends to be your friend and help you escape some freaks but then uses that to lure you into his kitchen of nightmares. He takes you to an undisclosed portion of the hospital, turns you into Chucky from Sons of Anarchy, then you escape and gotta avoid him while moving through rooms filled with restrained patients who can act like alarms if you startle them. The way out also involves going through tight hallways that he is practically guarding. So you duck under beds, try to lure him out of the hallways, and then run for it when you feel safe. At some point in this game, you lose your camera and that's pretty tense. Not because something happens, but just because at this point, you've come to rely on this tool so much that having it stripped away from you just makes you feel naked. Everything else in this game is a variation of you have to go into an area to either flip a switch or get a key while having to avoid... You, you, well, you know. But the fun is figuring out the best way to either rush or sneak past them. Doors and crevices are your best friend. Doors because they can make the enemy stop in their tracks as they're pursuing you. And crevices because they just can't pass through them at all so they essentially act as safe zones. There's another great moment with what I call the Ding Dong Twins where they pincer ambush you at the ends of a hallway and you have to make a quick decision on how to get out of there which involves jumping through a window and shimmying along the ledge, but then they just kind of mock you as you do that. Vanished without a trace. I just had sarcasm. It's like, oh yeah, they're gonna grab me when I jump back through the other window, but no, they're just gone. Okay. But... Yeah, in, in a gist, that's Outlast. I could talk about the story more, but honestly, it's very nonsensical. A priest drugs you and then helps you all in order for you to record his holy sacrifice. Like, thanks for dragging me into your suicide, dude. I just wanted to go home. I didn't ask for this. And as I said earlier, a plot about human experiments is revealed because that's just how these things go. Grass is green, the water's red, and corporations are evil. Do y'all really care? I don't because again, it's a haunted house and like haunted houses, I don't go there to dissect the lore. Some of the horror can feel a bit too much like the naked people or this necrophilia scene. And yes, this game has a necrophilia scene, but even that's played up for laughs as the psycho doing it starts giving you shit for walking in on him. What the f is the matter with you? You weren't invited to this, you goddamn sicko. You know, that's the problem here. Not that he was f***ing a dead body, but that you didn't knock before entering the room. You really should have more manners than that. To this game's credit, it does warn you when you boot up the game that there's going to be some disturbing content, so, you know, past that point, you really have yourself to blame if you see something that unnerves you. <laughs> yeah, but at the end of the day, I just wanted a fun horror madhouse, and that's what I get with Outlast, and I enjoy it for what it is. But here's where we have a bit of a pivot, because for as much as I love Outlast 1, that love does not extend to its DLC or its sequel. Whistleblower is a parallel story to the first game, where you play as Waylon Park, the guy who initially tipped off Miles to begin with. But not before his boss caught him stealing company pens and punished him with the worst movie ever, The War Shack, coming to a theater near you. In theory, and on paper, it's just more Outlast, but the whole experience is just so... It just lacks those moments the main game had. It has gruesome imagery, it has threats to run and hide from, but no interesting environments or scenarios like the first game. I guess running from this guy with a handsaw is decently cool, especially when you hear him in the distance, but 
not nearly as scary as Walker. What sucks is that there is a moment with him that could have been so much cooler if they played around with it a little more. See, he throws you in a furnace and you have to escape, but it's just a quick time event and then nothing. And what I wish they had done is make this whole area just an escape room that you have to avoid this guy in, with the furnaces being hiding spots that are slightly on, so, you know, you can avoid this guy, but you can't stay in the hiding spot too long out of fear of being burnt to death. I think that would have been really cool, but instead they don't do anything like that. Of course, threats from the main game show up to say, What's up? Like the Ding Dong twins staring you down, or Walker having a quick chase scene with you between, you know, trying to find Miles. Oh, that's one aspect about Whistleblower I liked. You get to see the events of the game from a different perspective, and I, I'm, I'm always a sucker for stuff like that. But other than that, nothing really stands out other than the pseudo-villain. This one, oddly, has a bit of a build-up to him. You see him get thrown in a test pod at the beginning of the game and used for experiments. And the result? He grows a forced feminization fetish. I like to call him Lieber Algenda because he's trying to trans everyone. Well, at least the men. Doing God's work. Bless him. In all seriousness, this character is in bad taste and there's no denying that but the original threw that away a long time ago. It is oddly the best moment gameplay wise, as your leg gets cut leaving you with a limp that you have to contend with while trying to avoid this guy, greater emphasizing stealth. It's stuff like that that made me appreciate the main game, putting me in an uncomfortable scenario, having your leg cut, and pairing it with a threat to avoid, a conservative's idea of what's happening in schools. That's Whistleblower. The game ends in a nice roundabout way as you escape in Miles' car as his possessed corpse follows, but other than that, there's really not much else to talk about. It's just a so-and-so experience, but at the very least, it's short and to the point and hard to really complain about. Unlike Outlast 2! So do I need to do the haunted house explanation again? If there is one major problem with Outlast 2 is that it fails as a haunted house, more so than Whistleblower, because again, that was short and mostly to the point. It didn't waste my time, unlike this game. So why does Outlast 2 fail? Well, for starters, it takes its story far more seriously than it should have. Now, I know that could be a bit of a vague complaint, but my metric for judging that is this. How much time is spent on the story versus how much time actually needed to be spent on the story. The intro is a slog. Where the first game just takes off, this one spends so much time in the beginning building up and building up for a story that's trying to be the next Silent Hill 2 Angela, but in reality is so poorly done that I have a hard time believing that the medium is as bad as people say it is. If you know, you know. If you don't know, let me explain. The pagans and Christians are having a little spat. Again. One sign wants to kill your girlfriend, the other wants to birth her child so it can bring the end times because they want to spite God or some shit like that. Listen, if you want to spite God, just become queer. That's practically spitting in his face, or so I've been told. The leader is already kind of there, a twink if there ever was one. The other half of the story involves going to the scariest place on earth, Catholic Middle School. Trust me, the kids would be safer in hell. During this part, you are following the character's past and having flashbacks surrounding the death of a girl he knew. And trust me guys, you're gonna be like super duper shocked to know what the bad guy did and who they are. I'll at least tell you who they are. And it's not a drug ween. We literally waste half the game on a plot line that amounts to the statistics don't lie. Seriously, if you care about the kids, you protest the churches. Clearly, there's supposed to be a parallel here between the two narratives. Your character, Blake, feels bad for not saving his friend from a religious weirdo, and hence is driven to save his girlfriend from these religious weirdos. It's not deep enough to be worth half the runtime of the game, that's for sure. You could cut out a lot of these school segments keep a few, and still communicate the same narrative. Or better yet, just remove it because wanting to save your girlfriend from religious weirdos is motivation enough. It also creates a whiplash effect with the game where one section is the woods, then the school, then the woods, then the school, just like that back and forth. They aren't interspersed at key moments where it could relate to the main story or done sparingly to feel like you're getting a change up in the gameplay. No, it's just back and forth like clockwork. The shame about all this is that Outlast 2 does see some gameplay improvements, like now being able to hide in barrels full of water. 
forcing you not to stay there or at the very least peek your head out and risk getting caught. You can crawl and even hide in bushes and I think these are great additions too. Lastly, your camera sees an addition in the form of the directional mic, which I think is also a great fit for this game. Even then, the directional mic doesn't use battery power, so it doesn't make resource management any harder, it's just another thing you can do. And even the new resource bandages are kind of obsolete because you self heal yourself anyways over time. And if you're playing this game right, you're not getting hit a lot. Even if these things were handled better, none of that matters when the haunted house is not good. Sure, there's a lot of gross things, like a lot of gross things. Some of it is even excessive for me. Not scary, excessive. At best, there are a couple of moments I thought were pretty good. One of them involves the now obligatory pseudo villain who shows up and terrorizes you. This one's a mix of this little gremlin guy who sits on top of a giant hulking dumb monster and they shoot arrows at you while you move along a cliff edge dodging behind rocks and that's a bit of a cool moment admittedly. Dodging the school monster under the bathroom stalls was also a cool moment. Running through the cornfield and using the directional microphone to keep track of threats was also I think a great area. I'm also a sucker for raining blood so I'll give the game that easy win. Oh and sneaking past the final threat is the closest this game gets to matching the quality of the original. Your only cover is waist high water that you can duck into which means you, you, you always have a hiding spot but that hiding spot limits your visibility anyways with the light they're carrying being the only indicator of where they are while you're underneath the water. I thought, I, I thought this was well done and probably the best water moment in the entire game. Speaking of which, that brings me into another problem I have with this sequel. See, the first game, even when it wasn't providing an interesting moment, most of the time alerted you to a threat before they knew you were around. This was great because it allowed you, the player, to assess your threats ahead of time and create a plan forward. Greater played into that hide and seek gameplay that the first game was going for. But here, most situations just turn into a sudden mad dash to the exit as the levels are either designed in a way where that's just straight up the best solution, designed with enemies that can find you easily anyway so there's no point in hiding so you might as well just run to the exit, halfway through the game just turns up in the straight up chase sequences. Sure, scurrying through tight spaces can be a bit tense but not after like the fifth or sixth time doing it in seemingly a row. And yeah, it just has none of that great cat and mouse gameplay that I think made the first game enjoyable. It also has horrible moments like the boat segment that just drag on. Like playing all these games back to back, I'm confident in saying that the first game did it best and knew what it was. The DLC felt like it knew what it was, but wasn't inspired as the main game was, and the sequel tried to be more, and it had a few good ideas, but ultimately it didn't find its footing with the level design or the narrative that it so desperately wants you to focus on. I will give this point to the second game. I like the fact that you can actually like, there's actually bits in the game that you can record and then watch the playback of. That's kind of neat. But now, now, I'm, now I'm just rambling. Case in point, if you enjoy haunted houses and you haven't played Outlast, play Outlast. And if you like Outlast, consider playing sequels. Anyways, if you like this video, you know, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't. Also, feel free to leave a comment if you played out last. Do you like them? Hate them? What's your favorite moment of these games? What's your least favorite moment of these games? I am interested in hearing back from you, the viewer. Assuming you watched the video up to this point. In which case, I thank you. Anyone who takes the time to fully watch one of my videos is greatly appreciated on this channel. Anyways, I'm the Digital Shinigami. I'm gonna go play in traffic now. I'll see you all later. Bye.